السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد يسرنا القرآن للذكر فهل من مدكر وقال الله تعالى وإنه لتنزيل رب العالمين نزل به الروح الأمين على قلبك لتكون من المنذرين بلسان عربي مبين صدق الله العظيم Today I was planning to give some introduction to the tafsir of Qur'an al-Kareem. But I started, as I started thinking about it and looking at the tafsir and introduction to tafsir, I thought it would be more important at this time to give some intro to the introduction of tafsir. Because to understand the knowledge of tafsir, what is tafsir? We need to understand, have little background on even understanding that science itself. As I started thinking about presenting examples of what is tafsir, how tafsir is done, how it is conducted, how mufassireen got the tafsir of the Qur'an. I realized that if I present these examples, many people may not be able to understand these examples. If we use the terminology, many of us may not understand the terminology. And when we take an ayah as an example, people won't even know where is that ayah and what is the connection with this ayah and the other ayah. So I thought today we'll spend little time trying to understand the signs of tafsir, what it takes what it needs to even understand that science itself. I'm not going to be just naming books and ask you to read those books because I know it's difficult. All I want to do is, through presenting simple and very simple example, trying to make it very clear to everyone that when a person is a mufassir, what sciences is he keeping in mind, what method is he keeping in mind in order for him to be able to be a mufassir and to do the true tafsir of the Qur'an and of the ayahs of Allah. There are many sciences that a mufassir would use. And when he puts all of these sciences together, he is able to come up with the right meaning and the understanding of the ayah. Now, when we start looking at these sciences, sometimes it may seem that it's impossible for us to understand Quran. So then people would come to one of the two conclusions. 
Number one, some people will say it's too difficult and forget about it. Number two, the second category of people would be those who would say, you know, these people who say tafsir, 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 they're all lying about the book. Allah's book is very easy and anyone can do it and forget about all of these sciences. And generally, you would find these two groups are very commonly found in our time. And the reason is because people have no time to study. So when they don't have time to study, they don't know what the science is all about. So either they will reject the science and have no importance for it. Or the second thing is, there are people who really don't care about deen. So they will use this as an excuse that it's difficult for me, I can't do it. Where to draw that line? This is something that we need to learn. Is Qur'an for everyone or is for a specific people? Is Qur'an is only for Mufassirin or for all the Muslims? Now, when we say Qur'an is for all the people, what does that mean? Does it mean that all the people are Mufassirin and we all can drive rules from Qur'an? These are the things that we really need to understand. And because of not understanding these things, people make major mistakes about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason I mentioned this point, that as we look into the science of tafsir, we don't want to get to the conclusion too quickly that it's too difficult for me. And I can't be a muhassir. And therefore I cannot benefit from it. At the same time, don't think that, you know, I have a friend, who is, he knows a real good tafsir, but he doesn't even know Arabic language. So it means that these sciences really, they don't mean nothing. Or I have seen a person, does a real good tafsir, but that person, I don't think, has studied all of these sciences of tafsir. Let's quickly understand the science of tafsir, not the tafsir itself. The science of tafsir. What is the science? Of course, as we can very well understand, when we say the word tafsir, right there comes to mind the explanation of Quran. Now, I just want to give you a quick overview on how a mufassir would understand the ayah of Quran, when he wants to do a tafsir, when he wants to write a tafsir, when he wants to explain an ayah to people, how he would understand the ayah. What are the steps he has to take, what methods he has to follow. Take an ayah, and now you want to explain that ayah, what is it the first thing you would know? And I'm sure everyone knows the main thing you would have to know even to get anywhere with the ayah is the language of the ayah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. A person has to know what does Qul means, what does huwa means, what Allah means, and what does ahad means. If he doesn't even know what does Qul means, how is he going to do the tafsir of Qul huwa Allahu ahad? So first thing, he has to know what does what is the literal meaning of each and every word in this ayah. This is the first thing any person who would like to do tafsir. Now, don't confuse this with a person who is trying to understand general message of the ayah. He may not know what Qul Hu Allahu Ahad means, but he looks at the translation, he gets a general message of the ayah, and he benefits from it. Not only this, there are times when you don't look at the translation of the ayah, you don't even know the meaning of the word, you are doing salah, or you heard a qari, a good, you know, we have some good qura in the world, you have, uh, the, you are hearing the recitation, you hear the recitation of the imam of the haram, or something like that, and you get moved by that recitation. Sometimes you see people crying by hearing the ayahs of the Quran. They don't know what the, the ayah means, and they don't know the translation of the ayah, but they, have, they are getting the effect of it. This is the effect of the wahi of the revelation. And they are benefiting from it. So not to say that people cannot benefit at all, but 
that is a different benefit than being a mufassir of the ayahs of Allah. So, there are different things. Really, this topic by itself, trying to present it in a simple way is so confusing that it's difficult to decide where to go and which direction a person should choose in even trying to understand this. There is something called tafsir, there is something called ta'wil, there is something called tadabbur in Qur'an, and there is something called ta'athur bil Qur'an. Very simply, a mufassir will do the tafsir and ta'wil, try to explain the meaning of the ayah, and then go into the depth of the message of the ayah. Tafsir and that is ta'wil. Then, there may be people who don't know too much about tafsir, but still they can do some tadabbur in Qur'an, which means ponder into the meanings of the Qur'an. Tadabbur could be in the words of Qur'an, in the meanings of Qur'an. It could be in both ways. So a person is pondering into the words of the Qur'an. He is doing some tadabbur in Qur'an. A person is pondering into the meaning of the, of the message of the Qur'an. And he is doing some pondering into tadabbur in the meanings of the Qur'an. Then there is a person who is getting ta'athur bil Qur'an. Ta'athur means he is getting affected by the message or by the recitation, by the barakah of the wahi. He doesn't understand, but he still there is a fact there on him. When he listens to Qur'an, he stops doing something that is wrong. He doesn't commit a bad word, he doesn't utter a bad word while Qur'an is being played. There is some ta'athur over there. There is some effect of the recitation over there. Qur'an is the deepest book of science, of knowledge that is available in the world. It's the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no end to it. Unfortunately, when people look at Qur'an, they think, you know, Qur'an is the most basic book that you can study about deen. This Qur'an is the deepest book that you can study about anything in this life. Is the knowledge of the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as deep as you go in it, the more you would drive pearls out of it and fruits out of it, and you keep on benefiting from it. There is no end to the benefits of it. So, going back to what I was explaining there, that when a person is trying to understand Qur'an, doing tafsir as I said now. When a person is trying to, trying to do the tafsir of Qur'an, understand the tafsir of Qur'an, what steps is he going through? Of course, as I said, the first thing that person would have to know is the language of the Qur'an. Because without the language, he won't know what the ayah really means. Translation will give him the gist. So he can benefit from it, but he won't become a mufassir by looking at the translation. People who don't know the language of Qur'an, and I don't really want to say don't know the Arabic language, because these days, knowing the Arabic language is totally different than knowing the language of Qur'an. These are totally two different things. So, people who don't know the language of Qur'an, by reading the translation or by knowing the language, the Arabic language, if they think that they can become a mufassir of Qur'an and they can interpret the Qur'an, they are making a major mistake. We need to know the language of Qur'an. For example, in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمْ حَسِبْتَ أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْكَهْفِ وَالرَّقِيمِ كَانُوا مِنْ آيَاتِنَا عَجَبًا what does the word Raqim mean? Now, this is something that anyone, even those who know the Arabic language, they must be thinking, what does Raqim mean? Now, of course, whatever it means, this tells us the language is very important, and not just the language, Arabic language, the language of Qur'an. To understand the language of Qur'an, we need to know the spoken language at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that language is still preserved in the poetry 
of the Jahiliyyah. Subhanallah, you know, each of these things that I'm mentioning is such a deep science by itself. Now, let me pause here for a minute, not to confuse you, it's just to give you some background of all of these sciences a little bit. Now we said, to understand the language of Qur'an, a person should know the language, spoken language at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to know that the best way is to study the poetry of the days of Jahiliyyah. And the reason I'm saying the poetry of the days of Jahiliyyah, because the poetry that came after the revelation of Qur'an, it's all affected by Qur'an and by the message of Qur'an. Muslims, non-Muslims, they all were so much affected by the language of Qur'an that then they started using the method of the language of Qur'an in their poetry. Amazing, amazing, Qur'an is a, such a unique book that is being recited with such a rhythm that even poetry is totally different than Qur'an. And there is no other book in the world that is being recited the way Qur'an is recited. The method of reading any other book in Arabic, of Arabic language is totally different. You can pick up any other book and present it to a person who is Qari and ask him to recite this the way he recited Qur'an, he won't be able to do it. Do some qira'ah with that book, he won't be able to do that. So even the rhythm, the poetry, the method of reciting it is totally different. The language is unique, sciences too deep, and the method of presenting is unbelievable for those who have been reading the Arabic literature and they had been the sources of all the poetry and they were considered to the kings in their field, to the high, be in the highest level in their field. And they had those titles that this is the king of the poetry. And all of a sudden the person finds himself to be facing something that is telling him that your whole life was nothing but a failure and you don't know anything. And he had to admit at the end that really I don't know anything. After reading these words of Quran, Really, I don't know anything. If I can make even an ayah, and Quran is challenging me again and again, to be surah Muslim. Bring a surah just like the surah of Quran, and I can't even do that. I have been saying poetry that people have been reciting it all around the world, with, and uh, uh, I was, uh, people are so proud to recite my poetry. And here, here I am at a point of failure where I can make a, one ayah like the ayahs of Quran. So. We need to know the language of the Qur'an. To know the language of the Qur'an, a person who's trying to do the tafsir of Qur'an, he needs to know the language spoken at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And once he knows that, of course, he would know it through the poetry that is available. And subhanallah, one of the very amazing facts about this poetry that was there of the days of Jahiliyyah. There was a time throughout the history of Islam in the last 1400 years, when the Ummah got very weak, and others took over. And when they took over, they took over not only the Muslim land, they even took all the books from our libraries. And until this day, there are a lot of books of Arabic poetry, poetry from the days of Jahiliyyah, that are preserved in their libraries not library in a Muslim country, in the libraries in non-Muslim countries. SubhanAllah, we may felt at that time that this thing is a big loss for the Ummah. But very recently, when some people started raising objections about Qur'an, that you know in the days of Jahiliyyah, those Arab poets, they were able to challenge the ayahs of Qur'an. And they had poetry that was stronger than the Qur'an, but Muslims, when they took the Khilafah, they gathered all of those books and they burned them. 
Now when you look at that poetry, that they have it preserved in their libraries, that poetry was not something written in the time of the Khilafah or after that. It is from the days of Jahiliyyah. It's not something that is in our libraries that we can say that people made it up and wrote it now, and they're claiming that it is from those days. Just like there are many other nations that would do that, just to prove that their books is the true book. They would do a lot of them, make them play a lot of tricks and games. But these books are in the libraries that were always handled by non-Muslims. Now we tell them, okay, where did this book come from and who wrote this, made this poetry? It is someone from the days of Jahiliyyah. Do you find anything over there that you can say it's really comparable to the message of Quran? Nothing. Of course, people tried it at the time of Prophet ﷺ, they tried it after that. There were few things that sometimes people like us would just get up and claim that, oh, you know, this seems like this message is stronger than the message of Qur'an. The way of presenting the message is better than the message of Qur'an. They're only the, were able to bring like two, three examples of that. And subhanAllah, when you look at those examples that they're presenting, that example by itself proves the truthfulness of Qur'an. Until this day, of course, I mentioned this many times before also, that there are a lot of universities in the world that teach the Arabic language. And they are run by non-Muslims. Never those departments of the Arabic language would dare to bring a poetry, even if it is an old one from the days of Jahiliyyah, or make something and present it to the Muslim Ummah saying that we presented something, we brought something that is very similar to Quran. Never. They don't dare to do this. Who does it? Someone from the street who doesn't have haya. He doesn't have no shame. And he doesn't care even if he people will know that he's a liar, he won't care. So he would come up with something and put it on the internet that, you know, I brought something that I made something like Quran. <coughs> but for those people to present these things and claim that this is like Quran by itself is a sign of the truthfulness of Quran, that subhanAllah, that this is something that their own people, people of their faith, same faith, will not ever try to back it up, they would never stand for it, and they will be ashamed to know that someone from their religion is doing something like this. If you present that type of thing to those who are really learned people in that field, and you tell them, look, there is a person from your religion, and he claims that he made something, this thing he, that he made is just like Quran. Could you back it up? Could you stand for it? Could you say that, yes, there is some truth in it? And that person, you would see him getting, his face is getting red and sweating, and say, you know, I'm sorry. So, language of Qur'an, and language that was spoken at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam will tell us what is the language of Qur'an, what were the meanings of the words, how they used to understand these words in those days. Remember this, there isn't any word of Qur'an. This is something guaranteed. There isn't any word of Qur'an that we can say that it was not translated properly, it was not understood properly by Sahaba, Tabi'een, and the Mufassireen. Each and every word is explained. Number two, there isn't any ayah of Qur'an that we can say the message of the ayah is or was not clear. And now I'm able to understand the ayah properly because in those days the message wasn't too clear for them. There isn't any ayah like this. Each and every word is explained, each and every ayah is explained. Okay, now a mufassir, to do the tafsir, he knows the language of Qur'an, he learned the language of Qur'an. Is this is the end? No, this is the beginning. This is the first step towards understanding the meaning of Qur'an. After he understands the meaning of the words, 
Now he just understood the language, the meanings of the word. After he understood this, the second thing he has to do is that understand the message of every word. There are two more steps now for understanding the message. One is understanding the message of every word by itself. Number two, understanding the general message of the full ayah, putting all words together. The word Allah comes in an ayah. A person need to understand what is behind this Allah. What does it mean? What it stands for? The word Rabb is used in another ayah. He has to understand the message of the word Rabb. What does it mean? What it says in this ayah? And what is the uh, application of the word Rabb towards our, with our, uh, towards the connection with human beings? Now we understood the word Rabb. But, say for example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. He understood the word, Hamd means this, Rabb means this, Alameen means this. Now he would understand the message of, when I say Alhamd in Quran, what does that affect me? How does it affect me? When I use the word Rabb, how does that affect me? When I use the word Alam in Quran, what, does the, how, what is the message that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to give us? Once I understood the message of each and every word of it, now I want to know that Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, putting all three words and three messages together, what is the message of the ayah here for me? Okay, to understand the message of the ayah, I need few more tools. One is the background of the ayah. Because there could be an ayah where the language of it is very clear, very simple. It may be something that even people who know a little bit of the language, they can understand it. But the message may not be what the person thinks it is. Because he's basing his knowledge only on the translation of the words. But once he would look into the background of the ayahs, then he may know, oh this ayah doesn't mean this, it means something else. Let me give you a simple example of it. There is an ayah in Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاحٌ فِي مَا طَعِمُوا إِذَا مَتَّقَوا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Simple meaning of the ayah is that for those who believe and have taqwa, there is no harm on them on what, for whatever they eat. لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاحٌ فِي مَا طَعِمُوا Whatever they eat, there is no harm as long as they have iman and taqwa. During the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, a situation was presented to him that a person found was caught drinking. This is a sahabi now. The person who was caught drinking was a sahabi. They brought him to Umar radiallahu anhu that he was drunk. Umar radiallahu asked him, did you drink alcohol? Yes, I did. So then we have to apply the Islamic punishment on you. He said, no, you can't. He said, why? He said, look at this ayah. Baini wa baina ka Allah. He said, Allah's book will make a decision between me and you. He said, okay, tell me what ayah. And he recited this ayah. Umar radiallahu anhu says to the sahaba that were sitting there, that do I have anyone that can answer this question from him? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu one of the youngest boys in that gathering, he gets up and he says, that yes, ya Amir al muminin this ayah is talking about the Sahaba that passed away or that were murdered during the battle of Badr and Uhud. Because alcohol was forbidden after that. So the question came to Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majma'een that how about those who died during those battles and they were murdered during those battles, and at that time, of course, because drinking was not forbidden, so still they had it in their system, in their stomach. So are they going to be punished for that? And do they have to pay an akhirah for it? And the ayah was revealed, as long as they are iman and taqwa, no, there is no sin on them, because at that time it wasn't forbidden. Now if a person doesn't know the background of the ayah, he applies it on himself, and he can he say, I can eat pork, I can drink alcohol, I can eat anything. So the background of the ayah is extremely important. Now, after he knows, this is only one of those tools. 
He understood the background of the ayah. Yet, this is not, he is not at the final step. There are many more steps that he has to go through. Now, next thing he wants to know is, a science that is called the science of al-nasikh wal-mansuf. Of abrogation in Islam. Which means, what are the ayahs, ahadith, and ahkam that were abrogated? Because he may be reading an ayah or getting a message that was abrogated. And he doesn't know it. And then he will bring a hukum that was at the early days of Islam and instead following it. Whereas that order was abrogated and is not to be followed anymore. But the order is still mentioned in Quran. And it may still be mentioned in the ahadith. But he doesn't know the other ahadith. So he has to know that science also. To make sure that whatever his understanding is correct and is not abrogated. Once he knows this, then he has to know how did Sahaba understood the message of the ayah. Because we are not the first Muslims in the world. I want to know how did Sahaba understood this ayah of Quran. For that, I have to refer to the ayahs, to, to the explanation given by Sahaba Radwanullahi alayhi majma'een. Once the person knows this also, now we go into a very important step that generally, generally people may, Mufassreen may make, mention it as one of the first steps. But I wanted to present it in a way this form so that we realize that First thing, we need this information before we get to the first step of a mufassir. After this process, now the person may be at the first step where he can really start working on tafsir. Right now, he wasn't even ready to work to work on tafsir. He was just getting himself to be get to get ready to work on tafsir. Now, after all of this, he has to know. The first method of tafsir is tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an. You need to explain the ayah through other ayahs. Every ayah that you take and you want to explain it, you want to do the tafsir of it, it has to be first explained in the light of other ayahs. What does this mean? There may be an ayah that talks about a hukum, about a ruling of sharia. And there are other ayahs that talk about the same ruling of sharia. To understand this ayah, I need to know all the other ayahs that talk about this one, so that I know that when I put all of these ayahs together, what the ruling is now, what's the final ruling. <laughs> because, for example, I want to understand salah from Qur'an. I take one ayah about salah and I take that as the final message of Qur'an. There may be another 200 ayahs that talk about salah in Qur'an. If I neglect those 200 ayahs, try to separate this ayah from those ayahs, then of course I won't be able to get the right meaning of what salah is all about in Qur'an. To understand what is Salah in Qur'an, I need to have all of those 200 ayahs in front of me. Now, we are not even talking about going into the detailed ahkam, detailed rulings. That's even beyond our grasp and our understanding. Let me just give you an example of it. Surah Tabbat Yada Abi Lahabi Watab. We all recite it. In that surah it says, وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ Now we may have read that at least hundred times, if not thousand times in our prayers. And now again, as we hear the ayah, if I would ask you this question, that what ruling do we drive from this ayah? During the time of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, a case was presented. The case came to the court saying that a husband and wife who are not Muslims, 
they lived in a non-Muslim country, then they moved in a Muslim country. Try to understand this now. They were living in a non-Muslim country, they moved into a Muslim country. There is a dispute amongst them about the inheritance. In the case of divorce or death, that can this wife inherit from her husband as a wife? There are some people who say that they were married in Darul Harb, Darul Kufr, and they are not going to be considered as husband and wife. <laughs> Others are saying they are not going to be considered a husband and wife because their marriage was an Islamic. And they don't have a rule of having witnesses and mahar and all of these things. So therefore, we are not going to accept them as husband and wife. The need to remarry according to the laws and the rules of Qur'an, and then only we will consider them as husband and wife. Imam Shafi rahimahullah, when this case was presented to him, he said, no, no. They would inherit and all of their rights and responsibilities will be just as a husband and wife. So he was asked to present a proof and he recited this ayah, وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَقَبْ they said, where does it say in this ayah? They said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Qur'an uses the word imra'atuhu, Abu Lahab's wife. And Mecca was Darul Harb. And they were buried in Mecca, they were not married in Medina. And still Allah calls her his wife. That means that marriage was recognized. You know, to get to that meaning, it's really not something that me and you would say, you know, now I'm a mufassir, I can do this. Unfortunately, people these days would claim to have a greater knowledge than those fuqaha, mufassirin, muhaddasin. They want to challenge all the scholars of Islam. And shaitan have presented a nice proof to them. You know, in those days, they didn't have all the hadith documented in one place. So they didn't know all the hadith that you know. Because you have a CD now. And all the hadith is on your computer, and your fingertips. You can do just type a word and search. Even if you type of words and search, you are not going to drive this rule from Umratu Hammalat al Hatab. So where are you going to get that fiqh, that understanding, that depth from one of the Mufassirin, he reads the ayah about Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي O Musa, I have casted my love on you. Which means I love you. Now, he knows that Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's title is Habibullah. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam's title is Kalimullah. The one who talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam's title is Habibullah. Okay. The ayah, وَالْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مُحَبَّةً minni. It's talking about kalam or about love? About love. Now, in simple words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing Musa alayhi salam how much he loves Musa alayhi salam. How much Allah loves Musa alayhi salam. By telling him, I casted my love on you, I put my love on you. So this Mufassir says, I knew they right there that there has to be a better way of explaining Allah's love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam in Quran. Because he's Habibullah. But what could be a better way? And he's thinking, what better word can you use than I love you? That may be the highest word you want to say to someone. So, he's thinking and thinking about it. Finally, he decided to recite the whole Qur'an with understanding the meanings to see where that meaning lies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I love you. In a better way, better than Al-Qaytu alayka muhabbatan minni. In a better wording than this. He recited the whole Quran three times. Who would do it? We say, I have a CD. What that CD is going to do for you? You don't even recite one Quran in a whole life. 
And if you're a good Muslim, then one Quran in one year. Those were the people, subhanAllah, Imam Shafi rahimahullah, as we know it. He used to recite two Quran every day during the month of Ramadan. He used to finish 60 Quran during the month of Ramadan. Who out of us would do it? Would even dare to do it? Forget about doing it. So, really, when you look into it, those, we can't compare ourselves with them. And this is shaitan trying to keep us away from the right deen, from following the right deen by telling us, you know, now we have access to the knowledge. And those people didn't have access. So now this mufassir, he recites, he says, he recited the whole Quran three times, pondering into the meanings and he couldn't find the word. Finally, when he was reading it the fourth time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his mind for understanding it. When he was in the ayah of Surah Al Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحَبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Say, if you love Allah, then follow me, that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will love you. He says, when I got to this ayah, I said, something over here, something is clicking over here. This is the one. And he kept on reciting it, and reciting it, and reciting it. Yes, it is there. What is there? He says, I found it now. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that, oh Muhammad, I love you so much, that tell the people, that not to talk how much about how much I love you. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you love Allah, then if you just imitate Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allah tells you that I love you. If a person would just imitate Prophet sallallahu and try to be like Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allah says to that person, I love you. So he's saying that word, the word that he said to Musa alayhi he would say to the follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this would tell us how much he must love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how do we get to that understanding? And now as I said, when people are just in the thing, you know, I have access to more information or they'll just compile in a better way and I have it just on my fingertips. Really, we don't have understanding. We can't understand it. And I have tried it myself just really, uh, just to see how it works. I tried it a couple of times, taking a mas'ala, a ruling, and I would say, okay, let me type words, similar words, and whatever could come to my mind about that topic, and search it in on the net and whatever, you know, all the programs that are available for tafsir, hadith, fiqh, and whatever. Gather some information and you're so proud of yourself, you did something great. Believe me, I just opened one book, Al-Fatha Al-Bari by Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah. I said, let me compare it here. As I open that, I find that Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah have brought much more depth, much more proofs, much more rulings about this ayah, related ayahs, related hadith, than what all of these programs together were able to provide me with. And that is only one man. And much more work was done after Hafiz ibn Hajar rahmatullahi Ali. And now we feel that, you know, I can do it because I have access to these. No, we don't. Because our taqwa is not there. And what taqullah wa yu'allimukum Allah. Ilm, the ilm of Allah comes through taqwa, not through softwares. Otherwise, kuffar will have larger access, higher access on the deen than we do. Because they may have softwares that we don't have. So, this ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on taqwa, on amal. When a person is doing amal. For us, we are fighting on how many rakahs should I perform during the month of Ramadan? And they were standing the whole night from Fajr and he would finish the tahajjud only when he would hear the adhan for Salat al-Tahajjud. Then he would finish his Salat al-Tahajjud. And eat few dates and his fast started. For us, eat at the beginning of the night, in the middle of the night, at the last portion of the night, and between that have some rest because I will be fasting tomorrow. And then I want to challenge those fuqaha of the ummah Subhanallah, we don't have that taqwa, we don't have that ilm, we don't have that amal. And 
without amal, there is no benefit of this alm that we have. And really, the understanding comes by amal, by taqwa. So, after knowing the meaning of the ayah, after knowing the translation, knowing the background, knowing the nasakh wal mansukh, what ayahs are abrogated, then we need to know how did Sahaba Ridwanullah understood. After knowing all of that, now we want tafsir al Quran, bil Quran, explaining Quran through Quran. And that has two steps to it. One is looking at that message in the light of other ayahs. This is one step. That where else do I find this message? For example, as I said, message is about salah. So where else do I find this message about salah? I collect those ayahs. Message is about hajj. So let me collect all the ayahs that are about hajj in Quran. This is one step. The second step is, words that are used in the ayah, there may be other ayahs that use same word. For what meaning the other ayahs have used this word? So that I keep those meanings also in mind when I try to understand this, this meaning. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Quran in Quran al kareem that this Quran is nur. Now, is the word nur used only for Quran or for other things also in Quran? What the word nur is used for in Quran? When a person would understand the word nur in the light of Quran, then he would be able to understand what Allah says. When Allah says, use the word nur for Quran, what does that mean? If a person really take it, takes it literally that for this Quran is nur. Now, just keep our mind blank for a minute. And you give it to a person, a normal person who is not familiar with religion. And you tell him that this Qur'an is a light. So he keeps Qur'an in his pocket. That when it's too, going to be too dark, I'm going to pull it out and then I will be able to see my path, my way. Is he going to see it like, use it like a flashlight? But the literal meaning could mean that. So what do I understand by the word nur? Now, when we use, see the, say the word nur about Qur'an, we all may have a different understanding of it. Where does that, 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 that understanding come from? It's just imagination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. What does that mean? What does the word nur mean in reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do I understand the right meaning of nur when Allah says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard? Or my imagination is telling me something that, you know, it will be so much nur and light and this and this is what Allah is all about. Is it imagination or it is something that I understand it from Quran? See, so here we understand the importance of Tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an. Understanding Qur'an through the other ayahs of the Qur'an. Understanding one ayah through the other ayahs. Understanding one message through the other, uh, one word through the other words in, in Qur'an. Then we have Tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Ahadith. Tafsir of Qur'an al-Kareem in the light of Ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best person to explain the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there is anything that Prophet sallallahu said about the ayah, that is the final word. Then my opinion and whatever new science, technology, that would mean nothing. Because Prophet sallallahu explained it this way, that is the final word. We can't change it. That's the end of it. So, tafsir al-Quran bil hadith. Trying to understand the meaning of the Qur'an in the light of the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many times, Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam, they understood a meaning of the ayah. When they presented that meaning to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told them that the thing they understood was not correct, and he corrected their understanding of the ayah. That tells us that just learning the Qur'an through the language, background, or any of that is, was not enough. You have to know the hadith. You need to know what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about the ayah. Now, the third step in this regard is for a mufassir is tafsir al-Qur'an bil athar. Athar means by the sayings of sahaba and tabi'een. Because they lived at the time. They lived at the time so they know 
what the ayah really means and what the application of the ayah is. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ dabha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about some big animals that run in the early morning. Which animal was that? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, it was horses. Ali radiallahu anhu heard that Abdullah ibn Abbas says this, he went to him. He said, you're ex- doing the tafsir of wal'adiyat dabha by horses, that these are horses, refers to the horses, but that's not correct. These are the camels. And the reason for that is, because we had only two horses at that time. It was mine, Ali radiallahu anhu, and al-miqdat. He said, only two of us had the horses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not taking out of two, he's taking out of plural, which means something more than three. And we didn't have three horses at that time before the revelation of the ayah. So it could only mean camels. See, knowing the situation, this is not background. This is not shanun nuzul. This is knowing the history of that time. This is knowing the seed of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not only this, also knowing about what time and when the ayah was revealed. Before this incident, after this incident. So subhanallah, this knowledge and the science of tafsir is very deep, very beautiful. And as I said, it's the ilm of Allah. So therefore, has no end to it. Now, if a person would keep these things in mind, and will start studying the tafsir, subhanallah, he could spend the whole life enjoying the benefits of Qur'an. And he would not want to do anything else in his life. Anyway, I was saying, tafsir through the athar, through the saying of sahaba and tabi'een. These days we hear this a lot, especially for those who want to do the tafsir and they don't know how to do it. So they want to find an excuse for themselves to be able to call mufassir. And you know, you know uh, I'm a mufassir. How would people in this, uh, really believe that I'm a mufassir? If someone would ask me a question about tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an, tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Hadith, in fact many of them believe me. It's my personal experience. Many of them, they don't even know what are the methods of tafsir. And they are considered to be a big mufassir in the world. Their CDs, their books, their everything, you know, this is, we have this woman that's a great mufassira. Subhanallah. And she doesn't know the language of Qur'an. Just the very beginning step. Doesn't know the language of Qur'an. But, she is the mufassira of Qur'an. And not only this, she gives certificates to others that now you are the mufassira of Qur'an too. And this fitna is really spreading. It's all around. Men and women all alike, they are becoming mufassireen of Qur'an and they don't even know the language of it. You ask them two questions, the third question, the person is that. Really, it's simplest thing. People like me would know it and he, they don't know it. I'm not a mufassir. Imagine when a person really is trying to put his low, himself in the level of mufassirin of Qur'an. This is, it reminds me, we had a great, very great point in the subcontinent. Allama Iqbal rahmatullahi alayhi. He's such a poet that books about his biography are written in Arabic language and people benefited from that too. Once a person, he was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with a deep understanding. Once a person presented a book of tafsir to him saying that I wrote this book on tafsir. So I like you to write some preface, some introduction to it, some words from you will be a blessing for me. So he said, okay, keep it. And I'm going to read it. Uh, come back to me next week and I will give it to you. So the next week the person came back and is waiting that he's going to tell me something about my book. 
saying, MashaAllah, such a great book and this, and he's not saying anything. And he's trying to remind him in nice ways, but he pretends that he didn't and doesn't understand what he's saying. That person was a physician, the one who wrote the tafsir. He was a physician. So, finally, he couldn't wait any longer and he had to go straight and he says, you know, last week when I came, I gave you my tafsir for writing some words on it. So, did you get any chance to go through it? He said, yes, yes, I did. And Rabbi, reading your tafsir, I really, I had a misunderstanding, a great misunderstanding about something that it was corrected by reading your tafsir. So this person, mashallah, was so proud that my tafsir is so great that people like him can have their understanding corrected by reading my tafsir. So he said, what would be that point, a special point that you think that really you, it was corrected and you got the right understanding of it by after reading my tafsir? He said, until now, by reading the history, I always thought that two people were the most oppressed in the history of the world. Uthman radiallahu anhu and Hussein radiallahu anhu. But after reading your tafsir, I realized the most oppressed is the book of Allah. That every jahil wants to say something about it. He said, no one is more oppressed than the book of Allah. The book that is the highest level of knowledge and the worst jahil like you wants to talk about it. So he said that misunderstanding was really corrected. That no, Uthman or Hussain radiallahu anhu were not the most oppressed one. This is the most oppressed one. Muslim. Anything is Muslim, really that is the book of Allah. And really these days you see really the zulm on the book of Allah. Any gathering in a masjid on the name of deen, wherever you want to have a gathering, one of the main topics in the gathering, tafsir of this ayah or this surah. And what happens? Brother so and so, inshallah your responsibility is that next session you will do the tafsir of ayah al-kursi for us. Now this brother, he goes and he studies the meaning, the translation, whatever he could. And at his time he could span and then he comes and he starts giving his opinion about that ayah. Subhanallah. Is the book of Allah is so low that person who has no time to study anything, anything of deen, doesn't know any ayah of Quran about this ayah, about any hadith, any uh, explanation from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, explanation of sahaba, tabi'in, and now he can just get up and he give his opinion about the ayahs of the Quran. And then what does giving the opinion means? Everyone else will take it as this is what Allah is telling us in Quran. And especially if that person read some articles on the internet about science and about modern technology, and he connects these ayahs to that technology, subhanAllah, then you would see how great of a mufassir he would be considered, and how his tafsir would be well accepted and recognized that, yeah, you know, what an understanding. This person is very, mashallah, very knowledgeable. Whereas, really, he's doing the worst jahala in his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Quran that who could be more zalim, more zalim, worse zalim, mimman iftara ala Allahi kadiba, woman azlamu mimman iftara ala Allahi kadiba, than the person who lies about Allah. And when we say this is in Quran, this is what the ayah means, this is what the ayah says, this is lying about Allah. Allah is not saying that. You put your opinion there and you're telling people this is what Allah is telling us. And people would take it seriously. Poor people, they have no understanding. They would take it, they will believe it. So, really this is something very important we realize that in order for a person to understand the tafsir, these are the steps a person has to go through. One more thing I was mentioning, that tafsir of Sahaba and Tabi'een. Sometimes we find difference of opinion between Sahaba and Tabi'een amongst themselves, just like the difference of opinion between Ali and Abbas radiallahu anhu, and there are many others. Remember, those people's difference of opinion was because of their knowledge about the ayahs. Now, for me to differ with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, I need to be at least somewhere close, if not on that level. 
We have no right to say that Abdullah ibn Abbas didn't know this. He is Mufassir al-Qur'an. All the Ummah agrees that Abdullah ibn Abbas is Mufassir al-Qur'an. With that we need to also know who were the Sahaba that were on the highest rank of Tafsir al-Qur'an. Inshallah, in our next sessions I will mention some of these details. As I said, this time I was just giving an intro to the introduction of Tafsir. Next week inshallah I will try to introduce the Tafsir a little bit. For that, inshallah we'll ask everyone for next week we will put the inshallah provide you with the table so you keep the uh, uh, translator in the Quran with the translation, we have it inshallah here, you don't have to bring it. But at least have a copy of it before you sit, so that when we look at the examples, we can understand what we are talking about. Because we need to compare the ayahs. We need to look at different type of meanings in the ayahs. And take the same words used in different ayahs in two different ways. So inshallah, that we will try to do in our next session. So we can understand the real science of tafsir. So, Tafsir of Sahaba and Tabi'in is very important. Their differences among themselves was because they had that knowledge and understanding in science. But for us, this is all ma'thur, which means it has been narrated. It has been narrated through Sahaba, through Tabi'in. So now, if my opinion goes against the opinion of a Sahabi or Tabi'i, then my opinion means nothing. It's really Sahaba, Sahaba and Tabi'in understood it and they have the way, the way they explained it. That is the final word. This is, of course, when it comes to tafsir. Now, after tafsir, the application. I have a new situation. We have a new situation. Would this ayah apply on this? Yes. That is something that me and you can do. And me and you means those who have the understanding of the ruling of driving the masail and applying the rules of Quran on situations. Then those people really, in our time, they can do it. The fuqaha of our time, the ulama of our time, the scholars of our time, they can do this. But provided they know what is the ruling, what are the rules of even doing this. Remember, for any person to talk about tafsir, he has to know a science called usul tafsir. For a person to know usul tafsir in depth, he has to know a science called ulum al Quran. Two different ones. He has to know what is ulum al-Qur'an, other science. And really, I don't even want to go into those details of what these sciences are. For a person to be able to give his opinion about fiqh, he need to know usul al-fiqh. Amazing people who don't even know, have, have any background about usul al-fiqh, and they want to give their opinion about fiqh. And because of that, the person has no usul. He has no rules that he can follow. Oh, it should be this one. When a person comes to that level, then only one ayah of Qur'an will apply to him in our situation, in our connection with him. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامَ When ignorant people talk to them, they say, Salam. Okay, Salam, brother. That's it. This is the end. I don't want to learn deen from you anymore. I don't want to base my knowledge on your opinion. So, we need to know the usul, the rules. Now, as I said earlier, by this I don't want to scare anyone thinking that Qur'an is not for me anymore. No, Qur'an is for all of us. And we all can benefit from Qur'an. How can we benefit from Qur'an? Number one, we benefit from Qur'an by reciting the ayahs of Qur'an. This is great benefit. Number two, by trying to follow the, or say, let's say number two is memorizing the ayahs of Al-Qur'an. Number three, ta'athur bil-Qur'an, which means having the effect of the ayahs of Al-Qur'an on our life. This is called ta'athur bil-Qur'an. Number four, trying to understand the message of Qur'an and how? Through mufassirin. So now, say for example, we are having a gathering where we don't have any of the scholars with us. And we don't have time to go into all of the depth that we just talked about a professor has to go through. What will be the easiest way? Easiest way is take a book of tafsir and read something from the book of tafsir. Rather than trying to do tafsir on our own, read some passages, some passages from one of the books of tafsir. Read tafsir ibn Kathir. Read al-Tabari. Read 
tafsir by Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah. Read one of the tafsir and that's it. Try to understand what the mufassir is explaining in that. If we understand that, that would be enough for us. Many of us, really those who do tafsir, they, don't need, they can't even understand what Imam Ibn Kathir is saying. Forget about understanding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. So if we just read that, if we can't even do that, then there are some tafsir in our own language. Reliable ulama, reliable scholars, based on the tafasir written by the scholars of the past, they wrote something for people like us, so that if we don't know the Arabic language, we can read it in our own language. We can just read some of that and try to understand the message from there. But for us to try to do our own tafsir, that is too much. Then we are going beyond our limits. Because we don't know what are the rules, where to stop, and and a, per, a person may end up saying something about Allah, which is wrong. I remember when we were students, we had the exam about tafsir. The exam that was about tafsir. So our teacher on the top, first thing he wrote, Bismillah. And just right after Bismillah, he wrote the hadith from Sunan al-Tirmizi, Man qala fil Qur'ani bi ra'yihi, فَقَدْ كَفَرْ A person who uses his opinion in Qur'an, that person falls into kufr. And the other hadith, مَنْ قَالَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ بِرَأْيِهِ فَأَصَابَ فَقَدْ أَخْطَى A person, this is also in Surah Al-Tirmizi, a person who uses his opinion in Qur'an, even if he gets it right, he gets the sin for saying it wrong because he used his opinion, he didn't base it on proof. After writing these two hadiths, then he wrote the questions. Which means if you know the answer, write it, you don't know it, don't try to put your opinion there. Very important that we understand this. This is it's not just about getting some marks, some extra marks, and I can say, okay, this could mean this too, and this is your, you know, it, now I did some research, and yes, yeah, sun runs this way, and this is what the ayah is saying, so ayah says this. How do you know ayah, ayah says this? Ayah may have some hint towards that science, but Allah is saying this, that's too much. That I have to really, really go into much more depth before I can say Allah is saying this. So anyway, this was just a brief introduction about the science and how Mufassirin worked on the science of tafsir and how deep the science is. Again, as I was mentioning, that this doesn't mean that we, me and you, we cannot understand it. There are ayahs that talk about just simple things. For example, ayahs remind us of Akhirah. Yes, we get the general message. The general message, we can get it from translation. That ayah is talking about Jannah, about Jahannam, about Adab in Qabr, about other things, these type of things. Reminders. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ We made Qur'an easy for understanding, for reminders. So, ridhikr could mean memorization, and really we see it has been made easy for memorization. And dhikr could mean reminder, which means to take the reminders from Qur'an about our akhirah, to live a life of taqwa. I need to remind myself, I recite the ayahs of the Qur'an. They remind me about my death, they remind me about akhirah, they remind me about the previous nations that were there, that disobeyed, how they were punished. So there is all of that. But for me, to try to start driving the rulings now, apply the rules on different situations, and say that this rule is driven from Qur'an, and Allah says this is Qur'an, no. That is not my position. That all we can do is, after reading the different tafasir, we can say, this is what is in the tafasir, and this is what we understand. And nowadays, this will be the application of the ayah. This is something that we can do. So, we need to really know where is our... Where are the boundaries for us? And what is it that we can do? And the reason I wanted to mention this, I don't know how many of us we may think that we benefited from this talk, but it's very important for all of us to understand this, because these days people have taken tafsir just like a game, really, like a joke. You know, anyone can pick it up and say anything about the meanings of Qur'an. And walayaz billah, through that, they fall into major sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Qur'an, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا Quran is a book of what? It's a book of Hidayah. Now, if me and you were to say, you know, the message that is given in this ayah, a lot of people are guided by the Quran, a lot of people are misguided through the same book. 
If I was to present this message, I would put Yahdi first and then I will say Yudillu. Yahdi bihi kathiran wa Yudillu bihi kathiran. Because it's a book of guidance. But Allah first thing He said, Yudillu bihi kathiran, then wa Yahdi bihi kathiran. Many people are misguided through the book and many people are guided through the book. Which means, many times, Dalala comes first through this book. A lot of people would use the book through Dalala, for Dalala, for their own things, for their personal things, and for misleading others. Every group, a hadith talk about 72 groups in Islam, every group based their proofs on ayahs of Al-Quran. And they misled others. When people break themselves from that signs of tafsir, then they can use their opinion and mislead others. And now, for those who don't know the, that anything like this does exist, will say, yeah, yeah, what he's saying was very true. It really made a lot of sense. And I looked in the Quran, and this is what the translation says too, and it really means that. No. That's not what it means. Let's go back to tafsir al-Quran bil Quran, tafsir al-Quran bil hadith, tafsir al-Quran through the athar, through the sahaba and tabi'een, and follow all those steps. At that time, we may see that no, this is not what the ayah means. It really means something different. So يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا Allah misguides a lot of people through the same book and a lot of people are guided through this book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us through those who get the hidayah from the book and not those who lose the hidayah wa ayaz billah because of not following the right steps in understanding the book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connect us to his book, give us the true knowledge of this book and bless us with the new of Qur'an. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين